He is the son of Cush and the grandson of Ham, and he is known for being a strong hunter. Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna in Sinar, commonly known as Nimrod's homeland, were all part of his dominion. The biblical figure of a rebellious people is Nimrod, whose name is interpreted as he who made all the people rebel against God in Genesis 10 verse 9. He is compared to Cush and Amraphel, the latter of whom is described as having gloomy words in the translation of his name. Because he was the first hunter, he also gave man his first taste of flesh. He was also the first to go to battle against other people. Nimrod wasn't a bad person at heart. But when he was a young man, he sacrificed to Yahweh the animals that he caught while hunting. He had such remarkable hunting success in Genesis 10 verse 9 because he was wearing the skin garments that God created for Adam and Eve, Genesis 3 verse 21. These coats were handed down from father to son and ended up in Noah's hands. They were in the ark with Noah when him took them. The animals knelt down in front of Nimrod when they saw that he was wearing them so that he would have no trouble catching them. The people, however, crowned him king because they thought that his tremendous power was the reason for these successes. According to another legend, battle broke out between the Japhethites, the Hamites, and Nimrod's family when he was 18 years old. The latter were initially in charge, but Nimrod fought and defeated them while in command of a tiny Kushite army. As a result, Tura was appointed as his minister and he was anointed king of all humans on earth. Nimrod's attitude toward Yahweh altered after experiencing such tremendous splendor, and he became the most overt idolater. Tura informed him of Abraham's birth, and he urged him to sell the child so he could kill him. In place of Abraham, whom Tura had hidden, Nimrod was presented with a slave child, and Nimrod smashed the boy to pieces. The vast majority of people concur that Nimrod was the one who conceived of and oversaw the building of the Tower of Babel. Nimrod, who was allegedly made mighty by God, constructed a tower in an effort to rebel against him. The tower is referred to by the rabbis as the House of Nimrod, and it is believed that its occupants were idolaters who abandoned it at a time of peace so that Jews might use it. After the builders of the tower were dispersed, Nimrod remained in Shinar and rebuilt his dominion. At this juncture, according to the Sefer Hayasher, he was given the name Amraphel in allusion to the deaths of his princes during the dispersion. The Targum of Pseudo-Jonathan claims, however, that Nimrod left Babylonia before building the tower and journeyed to Assyria, where he built four more cities, Nineveh, Rehoboth, Kala, and Rezin. The penalty meted out to the builders of the tower had little effect on Nimrod, he continued to worship idols. According to one interpretation, Nimrod was given the name Amraphel, which means cast in, because he specifically persecuted Abraham, who was given the order to be thrown into a scalding furnace. Nimrod resolved to cease persecuting the Yahweh worshipper after learning that Abraham had survived the furnace. Nevertheless, the next night, he had a dream in which a man was coming out of the furnace and coming toward him with a drawn sword. The man then hurled an egg towards Nimrod, which eventually transformed into a big river, drowning all of his warriors except for himself and three of his followers. Nimrod then escaped. The river then transformed once more into an egg, from which a little bird emerged and swooped towards Nimrod, gouging out his eye. Nimrod dispatched a hit squad to kill Abraham as he fled with his family to the country of Canaan because the dream was interpreted as a prophecy of Nimrod's defeat by Abraham. Ten years later, Nimrod appeared to battle Kedarlamer, king of Elam, who had migrated to Elam after the tower builders split apart to establish a separate kingdom there. Kedarlamer had been one of Nimrod's generals. Nimrod led his army into battle in an effort to punish his disobedient general, but the latter wiped him out. After that, Kedarlamer made Nimrod his subordinate and involved him in the battle against the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, which Abraham eventually won. Esau allegedly killed Nimrod out of his own jealousy toward him because they were both hunters, according to legend. Regarding Nimrod's identity, there are currently two widely recognized possibilities. The first, which G. Smith and Jeremiah both accepted, 
contends that Nimrod ought to be likened to the Babylonian hero Isdabar or Gishtabar from the Gilgamesh. The second argument contends that Nimrod and Marduk, the Babylonian Mercury, should be contrasted. It was put out by Sais, Pinches, and others. The first is based on the fact that Isdabar is portrayed in the Babylonian epos as a mighty hunter who is continuously accompanied by four dogs and as the founder of the first significant Asian state. In addition, Jeremiah thought it might be Namra Udu, the blazing light, rather than Isdabar, whose correct interpretation was still up for debate. The association with Nimrod would have been all but certain given this reading. Those who link Nimrod to Marduk contend that the name of Isdabar must be pronounced as Gilgamesh, as is now accepted, and that the signs that make up the name of Marduk, who is also pictured as a hunter, are pronounced as Amar Yudi, though they can also be read ideographically as Namr Yudi, which is Nimrod in Hebrew. It could be feasible to connect Marduk, the son of Ea, with the biblical Nimrod, the son of Cush, by understanding the language of the Bible to suggest that Nimrod was a descendant of Cush. Other versions propose that Nimrod represents the constellation Orion and a tribe rather than a particular individual. Arabs consider Nimrod to be the height of oppression, or Algebar. Regarding Nimrod's ancestry, Arabian historians dispute somewhat. According to one version, he controlled the Nabataeans, his relatives, for 500 years while also constructing the Tower of Babel and a bridge over the Euphrates. He was a Semite because he was the son of Mash and Aram. But the general assumption is that he was a Hamite, a son of Canaan the son of Cush, or a son of Cush the son of Canaan, Abri gives both, he was born during the reign of Ru, and he was the first to introduce fire worship. Another myth holds that there were in fact two Nimrods, the first of whom was the son of Cush and the second of whom was the legendary dictator who reigned during the time of Abraham. He was Canaan's son, making him the first Nimrod's great-grandson. According to Masudi, Nimrod, the first Babylonian ruler, presided over the building of various canals in Ira during the course of his 60-year reign. The author of the Tariq Muntab, who was quoted by Durbalot in his Bibliotheque Oriental, likens Nimrod to Dok, also known as Zok in Persian. The first Persian king to rule since the flood was Dok. However, al Khwarizmi connects him to Kai Kaos, the second Persian ruler of the Second Dynasty. Where Baghdad is now, Nimrod governed with justice in the beginning. But after being corrupted by Satan, he began to persecute everyone who worships God. Azar, Tura, the father of Abraham, served as his main vizier. The Midrashic tales of Abraham's birth, which feature Nimrod, and the tales of Nimrod's persecution of Abraham, whom he thrown into a furnace, are also told by the Mohammedans. Nimrod is mentioned in the Quran's chapter 11 verses 68 to 69. After seeing Abraham escape the furnace undamaged, Nimrod said to him, Thou hast a powerful God, I wish to offer him hospitality. Abraham explained to him that his God did not demand anyone's hospitality. But when Nimrod brought thousands of horned, miniature animals, fowl, and fish and had them all sacrificed to God, God disapproved. Embarrassed, Nimrod locked himself inside his palace and prevented anyone from coming near him. According to a different narrative, Nimrod challenged Abraham to a duel after the latter had come out of the furnace. When the scheduled day came, Nimrod had gathered a strong army, and he was surprised to see Abraham by himself. Abraham pointed to a gnat swarm that had destroyed Nimrod's army when asked where his army was. In front of his ministers, Nimrod declared that he would soar into the skies and slay the god of Abraham. As a result of learning from his ministers that such a journey would be difficult because to how high the skies are, Nimrod devised the plan to build a large tower as a means of completing his quest. After spending many years building the tower, Nimrod finally reached the top and was horrified to see that the heavens were still very far away. The tower fell the next day with such a crash that many people passed out from fright. Those who survived also lost their speech a reference to the confusion of tongues, which further embarrassed him. Nimrod was unaffected by this setback and came up with another strategy to reach the heavens. 
His large chest was constructed with openings on the top and bottom. The four corners of the chest were secured with stakes, one having a bit of flesh on it. For enormous vultures, or, according to another story, for eagles, that had previously consumed flesh were then chained to the stakes beneath the meat. One of Nimrod's most dedicated viziers joined him as he entered the box, and the four giant birds soared off, taking the chest with them. The vizier opened the upper and lower doors of the box alternately, looking in both directions to see if he was approaching heaven or not. As they rose, Nimrod took his bow and started shooting arrows into the sky. Eventually, they reached a height from which they could see nothing. In order to give Nimrod the idea that he had exacted revenge on Abraham's god, Gabriel next sent the blood-stained arrows back. Nimrod fell after circling in the air for a while. The angels thought a holy mandate had been conveyed to the earth as his chest struck the ground with such force that the mountain shook. There is a mention to this incident in the Quran 14 verse 47. The plans and plans of the impious caused the mountains to shake. Nimrod was not at all hurt by the fall. After these deeds, Nimrod continued to reign in a wicked manner. Four hundred years later, a man-shaped angel persuaded him to change his ways, but Nimrod asserted his authority as the only one, and he pressed God to join him in battle. In exchange for a three-day delay, Nimrod put together a formidable army, but gnat swarms decimated it. One of these insects is said to have entered Nimrod's nose, traveled to his brain, and started to gnaw away at it. A relief from pain Nimrod gave the command for someone to hammer on an anvil so that the noise would prevent the gnat from biting. Thank you for watching.